ultimately the future of the voice assistant is that it will be in every product you have. Taking those devices that are kind of complicated to use right now and just having a voice assistant where you can say, okay, this is what I want to do, do it for me. The first encounter I had with the notion of a talking computer was on a Canadian kids show called Today's Special sometime in the late 1980s. The show was set in a department store and mainly focused on the nocturnal exploits of a mannequin that would come to life. But the store itself was run by a computer called TXL. In reality, of course, TXL was a redressed Apple II with some greeblies planted on and the logo peeled off. But in the world of the show... It was a powerful AI that ran every electronic system in the store. And most importantly, that keyboard was mainly decorative because it could be operated by voice and it could talk back, thanks to the warm, well-cast voice of actress Robin Hale. Talking computers have long been a staple of sci-fi TV and film. I've previously mentioned the sardonic kit from Knight Rider. And one of the most memorable, perhaps, was the Whopper a.k.a. Joshua from War Games, his distinctive synthesized voice inviting a young Matthew Broderick to the infamous nice game of chess, but only after a spirited round of global thermonuclear war. And as it always seems to do with me, it all comes back to Star Trek. Almost every incarnation of the series over the past half century has featured as a character a computer built into the starship, Enterprise or otherwise. A computer that's always listening, in case you need help with anything as routine as finding a friend or turning on the lights, or as super critical as ejecting a breaching warp core. As a kid, the closest I could get to such a talking computer was a voice synthesizer built into my Windows 3.1 powered compact Presario. I imagine I could have used it to impersonate adults, as Mr. McIntosh did in 1994's Blank Check, but instead I used it mainly to see how many absurd or off-color sentences I could get its trio of animated characters to say. Hey, I was nine. Give me a break. So when smart assistants started sprouting up on smartphones a couple decades later, I was primed, I was excited, and I was blown away by the ability to bypass the buttons completely for asks like the weather forecast or a piece of barroom trivia. And when manufacturers let me retitle the custom keywords so I could invoke these assistants by saying, hello, computer, a la Scotty in Star Trek IV, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I was in heaven. It was only natural that these assistants would move into speakers, surprisingly affordable ones that found a permanent place in millions of homes. Today, we're learning how this technology crossed that gulf and where it might be going next. This is Living in the Future, a podcast powered by MediaTek that tells the story of technology that's evolved beyond the TV screen, transformed from fantastical cinematic science fiction to actual products that change the way we live and work. I'm your host, Michael Fisher, and this is Episode 5, The Talking Computer, or The Voice Assistant. This podcast is sponsored by MediaTek, the number one provider of chipsets for voice assistant products. MediaTek powers a whole galaxy's worth of devices you can talk to, from smart speakers to TVs to microwave ovens, even to toothbrushes. And to keep your communication with those devices easy and efficient, MediaTek supports advanced AI and natural language processing, so we can all get a little closer to living in the future. <laughs> My guest today is Jennifer Tui. She's a veteran tech reporter with bylines at the New York Times Wirecutter, the BBC, Wired, and she's currently the smart home reviewer at The Verge. Jen, welcome to the future. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. I appreciate you inviting me on. I'm very happy you were able to make the time. Um, to, to keep us on theme and hopefully inject a little variety into the show, because Lord knows I talk about Star Trek too much. When you were growing up, what was your favorite 
fictitious voice assistant from TV and film? So um, when I was thinking about this, uh, you know, I am I am a Trekkie. So, you know, <laughs> we, <laughs> in terms of diverging <laughs> nice. the theme, I might not be able to help that much. Um, but and I was, <laughs> you know, okay. very much against the grain of my my uh, contemporaries. Um, I was one of the few Trekkies of, <laughs> of my friends. So I was a bit of a loner on that front. Same. But then when I was thinking a bit mm. more about it and I kind of went a little further back, actually, Kit from Knight Rider. The talking car from Knight Rider. Yes. <laughs> the talking car. That's the first one, you know, growing up that really had an impact on me. And it was definitely one that had a lot of personality. <laughs> so, you know, it sticks in my mind when I think back about uh, about my first experiences with voice assistants. And that was what I always wanted. <laughs> Absolutely. I a oh man! I, and that were voiced by uh, <laughs> the guy who would later play George Feeney. I forgot the actor's name. Uh, P- Principal Feeney on Boy Meets right. World. Yeah. Yes. Um, Boys Meet <laughs> Boy Meets World. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and he was great. I loved. This I is loved the first that time show. we've talked about smart home assistants on this show. But I know from long experience that um, we will want to be careful of uh, triggering the uh, using the, the words. The active, yeah, the hot words. <laughs> I mean, hey, G. I'm used to saying, but uh, you know, I okay. don't. Do you have a code word for Alex? Uh. uh? <laughs> um. No, um, yeah, late. So I listen to a few, a, lot, a number of podcasts that have the yeah. same struggle, and you know, it's uh, sort of like uh, the Lady she, A she, or she, who or, shall not be she, named. Yeah, <laughs> she who shall not be named. Although we don't like right. to personify the voice assistants, but it's hard to do when you're trying not <laughs> yeah. to uh, try not to use them. <laughs> or you know, um, generally I tend to go by the. Um, Companies, uh, so like Amazon's voice assistant, Apple's yes. voice assistant, Google's voice it assistant, is. that can help. But it's a bit more of a mouthful. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll struggle through and see. Where, hopefully, you know, if you're going to sit down yeah, and listen to this episode, you folks are listening on headphones stuff. and uh, <laughs> apologies if we occasionally slip up. So, uh, OK, so that actually answers uh, my next question. Uh, so, as you know, I'm a phone reviewer. So what the audience very often asks me, what phone I'm using when I'm not reviewing? I'm going to put a similar version of that question to you. What brand of smart home runs your house when you're not testing a new one? If it is just the one or or multiple. I think it's because I've been doing this pretty much since the smart home started. Um, You know, I've been reviewing smart homes since 2010, 11. So um, I have never really had just a clean smart home. (laughs) the one space that I can, you know, call my own and then, you know, here's my test room. <laughs> so I've, I, and, and I've actually been asked this question multiple times and generally I demur in my answer, you know, like a, less, like a restaurant reviewer won't reveal their favorite restaurant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I tend to sort of say, well, I, I, if I had a choice, I would, you know, probably use version sections of all three or four if I'm being, um, particularly favorable to Samsung one day um, (laughs) of the voice assistants Um, because, you know, they they each have very unique benefits um, in the smart home specifically. But generally it comes down to, and this will be something I think you uh, can very much relate to, which phone I use. Oh, absolutely. Because they very much connect well with your phone, which is one of, as, as much as I enjoy Amazon's assistant, and I think actually probably that one has the, the best advantage in the smart home. For the daily interactions and ease of use, whichever phone I'm using, which is primarily an iPhone, um, I find the easiest way to manage my home as well. So that would put me more towards the Apple Home side of things. Um, Interesting. <laughs> and I also like the speed um, of the more local element of using Apple Home, uh, which Google doesn't really have yet. Yes. So things are a lot faster, I find, when I'm using um, Apple's Assistant as opposed to Google's. So I'm going to want to talk about those differences a, a, in a little bit because there are measurable differences and there are things that one does better than the other. But first, let's talk about how we got here just, you know, at, at this point in history. You said it <laughs> I, more than 10 years ago that this kind of new age of the smart home started with voice assistants. But we've had them on our phones for the longest time. I remember like primitive versions of voice styling um, from a nuance, I think, back in 2003. I remember being able to launch programs on my Windows mobile phone a few years after that. And of course, as you already mentioned, Siri really accelerated the whole thing in 2011. But As far as the home goes, as the story goes, Alexa was um, essentially willed into existence by 
Jeff Bezos and team, Bezos's pet project, and Google because of Star Trek. Because they, of Star Trek, that was the, yeah, the goal. Yeah, right? right. They want, they still do. That's what. Last time I spoke with Dave Limp, who um, manages most of the sort of smart home and Alexa services devices at, for Amazon, he's like, that's still our no- north star is to create Star Trek's computer. I love that. <laughs> so that's really, you know, that's the yeah. <laughs> that also answers the question I had a long time ago, which is why was Alexa the first and I think still the only one that lets you redo the code word. So it's Yeah, so yes. you can call it computer instead of uh, she who shall not be named. Um, yes. <laughs> but uh, like, so but it wasn't just Alexa, though. I mean, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, they're all moving into the space at the same time. You were there. I was there, but I was paying more attention to phones. What about the technology and or the culture of the time, do you think prompted that? I mean, was it just a matter of one company going first and everyone else following along? Or is there something that made that the right moment in time for this to happen? It was very much about the race for the next smartphone. You know, I think we, you know, computers had brought technology, personal computers had brought technology to the masses in a much more accessible way. And then the smartphone brought that even more, uh, in an even more palatable, digestible, easy to use way, um, being portable. And then the next stage really was that hands-free experience. So not having to have a device at all in your hand or sit down and type on a computer. Um, And I think, you know, there was the race for the next big tech, big tech, consumer tech. And just before um, Amazon's oh, system the came Fire into being, phone. Uh, yes, Amazon's smartphone right. poofed into non-existence. <laughs> so you know, it was that they, they were all you know throwing it all yeah. at the wall. I think at once to see what was gonna what was gonna stick. And you know, Amazon, whilst they failed spectacularly with the phone, really did hit the jackpot with the smart speaker. Um, and you know, they they launched the smart speaker with very little. <laughs> idea of what it was actually going to do. (laughs) It was like, we're just going to put this out there and see what happens. And that in many ways, when it comes to consumer tech is one of the the moves, you know, because like it happened with Twitter as well, you know, it happened with so many examples of consumer facing technology where it's the users that define how they're going to use it and what benefit they're going to get out of it. Um, And, you know, same with the iPhone, the app stores, you know, it was users, developers, um, they were the people rather than the company coming in and saying, look what we've got for you. This is great. Use it this way. Right. They put it out there. And then users are like, no, we're going to do this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is how we want to use it. So, uh, and that, you know, the whole, the smart home control side really kind of grew somewhat organically. It wasn't the original kind of main focus. The, the main focus was a computer that you could talk to, yeah. which is, you know, again, that's that opens infinite possibilities, doesn't it? There's so much you can do with a computer. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and speaking of which, I mean, we, we've seen the voice assistant try to gain a foothold in some of those other areas, too, like computers. I mean, Microsoft started building Cortana into Windows, I think somewhere around Windows 8, because uh, it, it was a Windows phone product that got built into Windows, maybe Windows 10. And then some manufacturers started offering Alexa on PCs. I think Lenovo and some others just would would pre-bundle Alexa. And and I thought for a moment that that might be where the next battle in this turf war would be fought. But I I don't know if you have other data, but anecdotally, it doesn't seem like folks have really embraced those modes. Everyone would rather just talk to a smart speaker and not talk to an assistant on their computer. Why do you think that didn't work? I don't think it's never going to happen. I agree that it did not happen in the initial form that companies tried to push it at us. I think the problem was it was too early. So Mm -hmm. we weren't used to using voice. And most, and for a lot of generations, we still aren't. Mm. But for, for example, my children's generation, I have a 12-year-old and a Uh 15-year-old, they will avoid typing on, on a keyboard at any point that they possibly can they will always use voice because that's what they've grown up with they certainly won't write anything with their hands (laughs) typing (laughs) is you know the the worst of the is the better of the two evils (laughs) and then the next if they can do it they're going to use voice so i think voice assistants and computers will definitely come back i do agree that though that at this point it's not that useful i think one place and people do talk a lot about um siri as being very dumb, yeah. but I actually do find it useful on my computer, especially when multitasking, um, being able to use a uh, voice assistant to pull up a file or something. There are benefits there. I think it's just, 
it was too early. Um, and I think we will eventually, you know, we're going to find it more useful. But you've already got a good input device most of the time when you're using a computer. You've got, you've the, got keyboard the keyboard right and the mouse. And Absolutely. Most times a keyboard is going to be a much better input device than voice. Yeah. But going forward, I could see a point where we have screens and voice control and no keyboards. Yeah. I feel like, especially around the home, you know, you don't want keyboards around the home. So I feel like screens and voice are going to be more simpatico going forward and, and talking maybe really into the future than I think keyboards eventually will become a secondary or tertiary input device for computers, but a long way in the future. <laughs> I think uh, I, you've made me feel a little bit younger today because I've learned I have something in common with your kids. I like to dictate too. <laughs> I, I like to bypass the keyboard when I can, at least on a mobile device. Yeah. Um, but yes. so, you know, the, the speaker, the, the smart home speaker is kind of this ultimate manifestation of what you were just talking about, right? Except it doesn't even have a monitor. It's just a voice interface. And the concept of how that works, moving into how these actually function, is really pretty simple, right? I mean, the hardware is a speaker connected to Wi-Fi with some onboard intelligence and a microphone. But most of the brains of the operation are happening in the cloud. Isn't that right? Yes, most uh, voice assistant interactions are processed in the cloud, um, but not all. And more and more, we're seeing a shift towards local processing where possible because it cuts down on the latency. And that is specifically crucial in the smart home when you don't want your lights <laughs> to take longer to turn on with your voice than they would with a light switch. So, um, but largely it was it's cloud based. Um, for, but recently I said like Amazon has its new AZ2 chip, which is a more powerful neural edge processor in some of its smart speakers. And that actually it, a, able to do so much more using machine learning on the edge, which is going to be a huge thing for smart voice control in the future is machine learning on the edge. Because to go to your original question, you know, what is it that these devices are doing? What are um, smart speakers, smart voice assistants, essentially, as you say, it's, it's a pretty basic system doing something really complicated yeah, <laughs> um, in the background. <laughs> because as much as it sounds easy for you and I to say, oh, here's a command, do it. If I tell you to do something, it's easy for you to do it. You tell a computer to do something with your voice, it's a lot harder for it to do that than it would be if you typed it in. No question. Because it's not a, it's a very difficult skill to um, manage. It's a difficult skill to learn as a human, um, it's an almost impossible skill for a computer to learn. Um, and that that is really the kind of frontier that all these companies are working towards, really making it much more natural for a, for a voice assistant to lit, to hear what we're saying, correctly understand it and correctly act on it, because that is not an easy process at all. No. And, <laughs> and this, the whole the whole concept behind it is natural language processing, which is basically converting speech into words, sounds and ideas and enabling sort of a language interaction between machines and humans via voice as opposed to input right. on a computer typing. So and human speech is really hard. It requires context. It has we have so many words that have multiple meanings. Mm -hmm. We have you know, different you can dialects ask as your, well different dialects, different uh, voice intonation. Some smart voices struggled to understand women versus men yes. or children in particular. They can't, you know, can't grasp uh, when a child requests something versus an adult. So basically what these computers are doing in the back, well, what voice assistants are doing in the background, in the cloud, sometimes locally using machine learning is turning that natural language into an artificial language that it can understand and then turning it back to send us our response All and then in, using the cloud as quickly as possible. I mean, to just as quickly as possible. We run out of patience in yeah, three or four <laughs> seconds. Very quickly. I, I, I was going to mention this later, but I, I'm always so envious when I go to my girlfriend's house because she uses uh, the Amazon voice assistant and that assistant, that product can turn her lights on and off so rapidly. Whereas I have to wait for Google to kind of send that and send my request to somewhere and then wait for it to hear back. At least that is how I perceive it. I'm not sure if Google is actually doing it locally or not. But yeah, it's um, it's amazing how quickly I run out of patience with something that is objectively so impressive. Yes. I mean, and that's the thing that I think is always worth a step back when you get frustrated with a smart speaker and think about what it's doing. It is actually really impressive. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we've, but it's almost a um, victim of its own success. We've gotten, we've got used to it being able to do it 
that we get frustrated when it can't, but it is it is an impressive engineering feat. And, you know, you can read all about the history of how Alexa came to being or how any of these voice assistants have started, you know, how they've how we got to where we are today. And it's really impressive technical feet but ultimately you know it has to work otherwise what's the point i mean we don't you know you you need your smartphone to turn on and make a phone call as well as surf the web as well as control your smart home just as easily as you want your smart voice assistant to so it has to work and that's really the race right now is all of the companies trying to make it so much better as quickly as possible with many barriers because especially in the home and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit. There's the whole privacy and data yeah. concern that people have about having these in their home. But but just to go back to ultimately answer, to round up the end of your question there, when the, the device um, receives a, re- a request from us, it sends the request to the cloud. And like, for an example, for Alexa, it would be uses Alexa voice services. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's processed all in the cloud and then sent back. Um, but it's much harder with smart speakers than it is with smartphones, as you mentioned in the beginning, because um, smartphones, you're talking directly into the device, right? So yes. you're giving it a clear command. With a smart speaker, it's got to deal with an entire home uh, where there's going to be a lot of different noise, ambient noise, different things going on. You're going to be in different parts of the right. room. Right. A home is so a noisy place, key- right? It has to be able very- to pick your voice from that soup, that morass of just like random sound everywhere. Exactly. So one of the key things about smart speaker is signal processing. So, you know, dealing with the ambient noise and honing in on the signal that it's supposed to be picking up on. And that's where it uses these multiple far field microphones that you'll find on smart speakers. And that that's far a really field key microphones. part. And those, yes. Yeah. All right. So tell, like, I have heard that term so many times in briefings and all that kind of stuff. Do you know? I mean, briefly, and I, I'm sorry I didn't uh, put this in my in my pre-show <laughs> outline, but can you can you talk about how how a far field microphone works at at all? Just broadly speaking, whether the hardware is designed differently or whether it's all being done in software to be able to capture sounds from afar. I'm not fully up on all the engineering specs but yes it is a different it's different from a standard microphone it's doing it's uh, there's a combination of hardware and software to try and pick up okay. on these multiple signals that we talked about and also process those signals in different ways so it can and again this comes down to machine learning like being able to understand when it's hearing maybe a voice from a television versus a voice mm-hmm. from a person, like understanding the different types of audio that's coming in so that, for example, when you're watching TV and there's an ad for Amazon's voice assistant, they have finally <laughs> made it so that it doesn't, it should not make your smart speaker wake up because it knows it's that the microphones are able to recognize that that's not a human voice in the room talking to it, that's a television talking. So those types of things make it so much more complicated to in, you know enable smart voice assistant on a speaker versus on a um, computer or a, a per- phone or any kind of personal device. I, I have to ask another question that was asked a lot, that we've talked about this a lot. It seems like we don't talk about it much anymore, maybe because people's apprehensions were soothed and maybe just because of the news cycle and everybody got tired of it. Um, <laughs> I don't think my voice assistant is spying on me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seven smart speakers in my apartment. But um, are they? Are they spying on us? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's why that's they impressive. always break. There are too many. I know. <laughs> that's Well, that's one thing that annoys me a lot. That's the one thing they have not really cracked is getting only one to respond to you. As, or know. the one next to you to respond to you, as opposed to the one in the other bedroom, which, you know, where Across someone's sleeping. Yeah. yeah. That's, you know, uh. and Amazon says it's cracked it, but it hasn't. Um, nope. Apple, Google not says so the same much. Thing and they Go- yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's, again, yep. this is the far field microphone issue, because sometimes they're too <laughs> good. <laughs> in well, fact. And they're supposed to talk ultrasonically, aren't they? Aren't they supposed to emit sounds that they can right. hear, but we can't? That's, yeah. And that that's, but then if you have third party devices with, the smart speaker assistant in those don't have don't always have that capability so that can be so for example i have a smart smoke alarm that has um, amazon's voice assistant in and it will hear me every single time i ask no matter where i am in the house because it's too powerful oh, it's, <laughs> it's so annoying but yes slight <laughs> slight uh, side note there but yeah it is actually one thing i had learned from talking to amazon about this problem is the worst thing you can do when you're trying to get your smart speaker to listen to you when it, you know, sometimes they don't hear you properly is go up close and talk to it like this because it's not designed oh. for you to do that. 
it's actually much better if you step back and talk to it because of Interesting. the nature of the Farfield microphones and the way that they're able to pick up which one you're talking huh. to is based on where you're like standing. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you had a camera set up on a tripod with a telephoto lens, it would be akin to g- crossing the room, getting far away from it in order to be in focus exactly. rather than Exactly. That's very good. It. I yeah. See. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly it. right. It's not designed for you to be to be used as a personal device for you to talk right into it. So no huh. no you standing there yelling at your smart speaker right in front of its its face. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, again, side note. But in terms yeah. of what your question about, you know, are they really listening to us everything are they they are listening to everything we say when you say the wake word. So basically, technically the way it is, is that they're designed to constantly listen, but not but not connected to the internet and not recording. So they're constantly listening for the wake word. So always listening mm-hmm. for the wake word is the way Amazon will say it when you ask them. Um, so yes, always listening for the wake word, whichever one you've asked it to listen to. Um, and it's good sometimes to have different options so that you don't, you know, especially if you have someone in your house whose name begins with A. Um, and it's frustrating that some right. of the other options don't have choices there. Um, but yes, yes, it is. But but that none of that's been recorded and none of that's been sent to the cloud or anything. It, the recording and processing will only start as soon as it hears the wake word. So if it has a false wake wake up. So where it starts listening to because it thinks it heard the right. wake word. When you used to be able to say, uh, OK, boomer, and, and the, the speaker would wake up if it was a Google Assistant one. Yes. Right. And that can happen. Um, you can always, you know, that hap- that still happens, but it, it's also they've somewhat addressed this. So once it realizes it wasn't being woken on purpose, it will, you know, kind of it will reset so that not that process isn't happening you know it's not sending your data to the cloud anymore but yes mm-hmm. as soon as you say the wake word it's recording listening and if it needs to so if it's not something you, it can do locally it will be sending that to the cloud um <laughs> Oh, sorry. Do, do, uh, do, do meowing wake words so, uh, work? Do you... <laughs> I haven't seen my cat in two and a half weeks. Oh, and I think no, he's quite we've... upset that I ignored him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we love cats on this podcast. That's all right. But there are a lot of safeguards and you can go in and delete your data. You can tell it not to listen, you know, but it does require you having to do it. And that's the thing that I think is difficult for the average consumer. Before we get off of wake words, I, I want to say I think it is really cool. Um, the, the the biggest test of my privacy versus convenience personal equation came when Google added a bun- the ability to say, you wouldn't have to say, okay, G. You wouldn't have to say the wake word if you wanted to say, stop an alarm, which I do every morning. I love that I can just say, stop when an alarm is going off and it will stop. And on the, you know, on the Pixel phones, I think you can, you can do voice wake ups or, or, or voice answering of calls without, again, prefacing it with the okay g wake word i think that's really cool and i think i think it's really cool because i also um love the star trek computer (laughs) um but i don't know it's it's you know i i i also am heartened by the fact that i think the highest profile uh leak or um privacy concern came from i think an amazon product and that was a case of the speaker thinking it heard the wake word turning on and then recording like a conversation with private details or something like that. And it, it, but it, it would never have happened if it hadn't thought someone said its name. So I think that's the key takeaway yeah. that, that I had. And right? I think you've also got to bear in mind these companies, you know, there's two, there's two different things here. There's data and there's privacy. Um, there's privacy and there's security, which are also separate issues. But, you know, Amazon's very clear that it's not selling your data to third parties, or if it is, if the third party is involved, it's very clear, but it is using your data. And this is something that is incredibly valuable for voice assistants. We would not have voice assistants without data. This is also why Siri is not that good because they, because of Apple's famous, you know, privacy focus. Um, with, without data, without machine, you know, we talked earlier about machine learning and I had meant to mention, you know, these devices are, they will learn and get better in your home as they listen to you specifically. And this might be why you're, you mentioned that you have a better experience in your girlfriend's apartment with certain devices than you do in yours or vice versa, mm-hmm. because they, they will learn and they will get better based on your voice. When you set up your iPhone, when you set up your Alexa, it will 
train you have to train it it maybe only takes 20 seconds you ask, ask a few questions um right. but that it's using your voice and it's learning from you and you know it needs that data to get better it also needs data from everyone to get better um that's how you know that's how these large language models and i'm sure we'll get into that too um, yeah. this is how this whole um voice assistant world works is the more we can feed into it the better it will get so there's this, as you say, privacy versus convenience payoff, which to be fair to every corner of technology is is there everywhere. That's something that we focus, we all, you know, have to focus on when I review products for The Verge, and that's a huge focus we have is, you know, what is what are we getting out of this versus what are we giving away? <laughs> and Absolutely, that's important yeah. to understand that balance. Um, so, you know, but if you don't, if you if you're worried about smart speakers in your home, you know, if you have a smartphone, you basically have a very <laughs> similar device. A microphone, right? Yeah. Home, <laughs> doing the same. That one has a camera. Um, yeah. So, uh, but but the home just feels different. I think people and I understand that sort of natural aversion to having anything that could be invading what is your most private space because you take your phone out of the home in public, you go to the office with it, but but somehow, you know, your home is your castle, your home is your sanctuary. And it, yes. I can, I understand why people are like, I'm never having one of those things in my home, but I don't Definitely. believe them. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, no. I think the convenience will outweigh those concerns. Once these companies, and you've got to remember this too, while the companies might want to sell you stuff, it is in their prime interests not to have anything negative happen, you know? Right. If you're talking about an Amazon, a Google, or an Apple, you know, the safeguards and security that they're, they're constantly trying to make sure nothing bad's gonna happen. But as right. we know, the internet is the internet. And so hacking and all such, you know, is always gonna be a concern, but that's with any computing device, not just voice assistants. Right. Um, you mentioned training these things on our voices a second ago, but it, it, I don't wanna move on without acknowledging that these devices all have voices of their own. Um, Alexa is voiced by Nina Rowley, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Susan Bennett is Siri. And for Cortana, Microsoft <laughs> famously used, uh, employed Jen Taylor, the same actor who voiced the same character in the Halo video games. I thought that was really cool. I wish Cortana had lasted a little bit longer, um, but that's beside the point. These days, <laughs> the, uh, the actor voices, they're more like the bones holding up a kind of generated voice than the actual end product, right? Like they, they don't, these companies don't need to bring these actors back in for additional recording sessions that often, if at all, because they have enough tools in the toolbox that they've already recorded. They can kind of make those voices say anything they want with essentially AI. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I, I think there's, well, and I think there's also a shift away from the personalization um, mm -hmm. in a way towards more kind of, generic voice assistants but but to answer to address that specific point yes they don't they don't need to come in like monthly for new recordings um there are i think they just need a, they just need a base sort of package um, and then they're able to regenerate and use that those and i mean there's i've read some great stories about voice actors who've had to spend you know months just reading most boring inane texts out yes. and then that but then that's all that was needed so um right. going forward it's but there's also a real and this may be slightly off topic but there's a real concern or uh, it's going to be interesting to see as artificial intelligence and, and you know as we move forward in this space with you know voice cloning and this kind oh, of yeah. capability of being able to have a voice assistant use your voice to it, mimic you which could be very convenient and also really scary oh, terrifying absolutely <laughs> terrifying right. in yeah. so many ways <laughs> we're gonna have to come up with uh, new forms of authentication for voice calls even you know if somebody calls right. you up it's like is this really I you know. i don't know but then yeah. the other interesting part with voice is like uh, for example with amazon they they use they did all these celebrity voices for a while which have yes. now all gone by the wayside um i don't know i'm guessing pot potentially financially that was there was a motivation there, you know, that costs money to license this and to keep going with it. But they've pretty much ditched all of that now. Um, and, you know, I said, I think we're kind of moving towards more utility, less personality. I think earlier on, they kind of wanted the personality to make this more like a companion and something yeah. fun. Whereas now we're beginning to get used to using them. So yeah. it's much more just like a basic utilitarian. interface. Yeah. Yes, utilitarian. Well, I don't. I, let's. I, I'm going to save that for the end because that's my favorite thing I want to talk about. You just reminded me that I'm going to. 
I like making myself sad, and I'm going to do that at the end of the show. Uh, but but first, <laughs> oh. let's talk. About, yeah, I know. <laughs> but first, um, let's hit uh, let's hit the future real quick because yes, yeah. we've we've touched on a little bit of this. But Ars Technica reported late last year that Alexa is losing uh, like a lot of money um, at, at Amazon. Google has reportedly moved a bunch of engineers from the assistant unit to at Bard, the Bard AI team. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella <laughs> recently called voice assistants as a whole, dumb as a rock. Uh, I have definitely felt the effects of that in my Google Assistant household. Um, y yes, I have seven speakers. That's not the whole problem. I, I, it is demonstrably less reliable than before. And I will post a review of something that depends on the Google Assistant. And there's always that little part of me that is doubtful when I post a review, I'm like, boy, this is kind of, ne this is quite negative. Am I the only one? Did I <laughs> do enough no, work? <laughs> and then, yeah, oh my God, all the comments on that one were like, yes, oh my God, yes, the Google Assistant is terrible now, yada, 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 yada. Why does it seem like a lot of companies have, you know, kind of given up on voice assistants or at least de-emphasized them? Is it just that they're not making enough money, do you think? I think it varies depending on which company. Basically, uh, uh, my... Initial response would be, I don't think these tech companies are giving up on voice assistants. I think they are mm. giving up on them as they are today. I think they are looking to, you know, to reinvent, to recreate or to superpower them, depending on how they were initially built, because the way that a voice assistant was initially built will affect how they can grow it. Ultimately, voice control is not going away. Um, whether the three, you know, the Alexas, the Google Assistant, the Siri, whether we'll still be using those names in 10 years' time with a completely different powered machine underneath, hard to know. I would have thought name recognition is pretty powerful in this space. So I, we, may, they, we may see complete reinventions of those. I, don't, I do think the name Google Assistant might go away because, God, it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the worst one. Hey, Google is the most annoying one to use, in my, in my opinion. Um, Alexa and Siri are a lot easier. Siri's just recently changed. So you can now, you now can just say Siri instead of Hey Siri, oh, yeah. which is a small but big change, yes. <laughs> very useful change. Um, and, you know, I think ultimately, though, that the, the tech, oh, there we go again. There, there we go. <laughs> yeah. We just did. Um, I found some, I found some answers for you on the web. Right there is the there biggest problem that voice assistants have. Yes. <laughs> and this is where the change is coming. And this is where the chat GPT, the LLMs, yeah. you know, the whole, the whole move into artificial digital intelligence is coming to our voice assistants. That's what so, I So yes, to I mean, yeah. I mean, it's changing. Right. Let's, they are dumb today. They will be smarter tomorrow. <laughs> let's jump into that for sure. Cause that's, that's the second to last point we've got. Like the, that seems like the natural evolution evolution of not just voice yeah. assistants, but also large language model based AI. Like I enjoy talking to chat GPT, but I don't enjoy that in order to do to do that. I have to like have an instant message conversation with it using a keyboard that I type. We really could have conversations with a computer that would be a lot more human like and a lot more capable if LLM type technology were were given a voice interface, essentially. And you've done some reporting that says Amazon is already on the way to incorporating that. Yes, they've been pretty um, open about that their, their Alexa teacher model that they work with has already been sort of massaged and changed to work with um, ChatGPT style generative AI. Hmm. There's also an interesting voice assistant called Josh AI, um, which is a uh, high-end Cedia type, so custom install voice control system for the smart home. Oh. Um, you can't kind of buy off the shelf, but you, um, if you've got like a, a Control 4 or a Savant or a Crestron system in your home, you could have it controlled by Josh AI. And they have already, they just, just before I went on holiday a couple of weeks ago, they just launched their first Jack, chat GPT powered version of Josh AI. So they can, th there's so much happening here in this, the voice assistant chat GPT space. Um, I think, it's not happening as fast as we've seen the rollout for like search on the web because of all the problems you saw with the rollout of search on the web. We yeah. really don't want to see those in our homes. You know, we don't want our smart homes hallucinating. Right. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, there's, there needs to be a lot of guardrails put in place. And I spoke with the, I spoke both with Dave Limp at Amazon and the head of Josh AI and about, you know, 
that's the main concentration right now is trying to figure out how to kind of really rein in and make the powers of generative AI work in the smart home in a very safeguarded way. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, that's not an easy, um, not an easy s problem to solve. Um, mm. But they, I think ultimately, we're going to see a conversion of the two. We're going to see a conversion of chatbots and voice assistants. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of what and a we're go from that would look like. Sorry to yeah, well, cut you off, but like, I, I th no. I, I'm... I, we've all experienced how confidently ChatGPT can lie to you. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm just envisioning myself looking out the window at a beautiful sunny day and asking for the weather forecast and then just saying, it's like, <laughs> it's currently thunder, thunder snowing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. Yes. I mean, or, you know, you ask your home to turn off the lights in the kitchen and it turns on the lights in the bedroom. I mean, right. that might seem like a small thing, but, you know, your child's asleep and then they just woke up your baby and then you're really mad. I <laughs> yes. mean, and it could get w w really bad too, because your homes, there's a lot of important things that, you know, we, yeah. we've got that you, you could just envision some terrifying. We've, we've all seen the terrifying examples of smart homes out of control, you know, in Black Mirror and Scream and all sorts of things. Imagine right. if, it, you know, if your, your home started hallucinating with your <laughs> LLMs, but it's all... That's all quite scary, but the guardrails need to be yeah. created and put in place. This is so why that we we'll, don't have them but, yet. Yeah, this is why. And this is why we don't have it yet, but okay. we will. And they will become, ultimately, I think the difference will be, we'll go from being transactional with our voice assistants um, in the smart home to conversational. Hmm. And that is going to be a huge shift because right now you have to be very specific with your wording. You have to use your wake word, then you have to use the specific invocation, then you have to use the correct utterance. You know, you have to say, you know, voice assistant, ask my robot vacuum to clean the kitchen. And you have to be very specific. Whereas with a chat GPT style smart home voice assistant, you can just be like, hey, um, I spilled the Cheerios. Can you go clean up the kitchen? And it will know what you want right. it to do. Yeah, it'll just and search for that smart change. vacuum that's uh, attached to the same network. Exactly. Like, cool, I'll go send the vacuum to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that will make a big difference. And then the other thing that's going to be really crucial for the smart home, and that is very much my space, <laughs> mm -hmm. is it will make it so much easier to program and set up smart devices. So right now, when you get smart light bulbs and a smart door lock and a smart speaker, you have to sit there, program everything. Like I want my smart lights to turn on when I unlock my door. I want my smart lights to turn on every morning at this time. And right, you have to, you have to build a routine. You have to do this whole routines. thing. Yeah. Yes, and you have to set all that up. Whereas ultimately when you have the generative AI, a predictive language model in your smart home, voice controlled space, it will be like, okay, you've got light bulbs and you've got a lock and you normally get up at this time of day and you normally go to bed at this time of night. Would you like me to set up this routine for you? Yeah. And you just say yes. And you're like, yep, okay, great. Thank you <laughs> for noticing. That's and yes, game please. changing yeah. for the smart home because that's the major barrier point for entry right now is how complicated it is. Even though it's not as complicated as it used to be, Right. you know, most people haven't got the time or inclination, but when it's that simple, that's that's going to be huge, I think. So that is a really good point. It's one I hadn't thought of, and I look forward to that. It, it is also very utilitarian. It is, as you've just said, it is also very uh, transactional, as these things are. These are hot, heavily commoditized products. My yeah. last question is um, about a category that I think is it's not dead, but it has been dying since it was born. Uh, social robotics. <laughs> um, I was for a while there, like at least in my circles, famously in love with Jibo, the robot um, who oh. died an early death because his servers were turned off when his company went bankrupt. Uh, but I still keep my kind of lobotomized Jibo around the house because I can't let him go. And he says, good morning to me every morning. And he tells me it's the wrong day of the week and we love Jibo. It's fine. But um, we've seen Jibo. We've seen, so sad. Yeah, I know it really is. It's very, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, but you know, then in the wake of Jibo was Vector. You know, Sony is still doing its Ibo robot dog, and the, even Amazon has that sixteen hundred rolling Astro dog. It could be called a social robot of sorts. But I made the point a few years ago when I got my heart broken that it's time to stop buying them until we can be assured they won't all die and and break our hearts again. And um, I mean, do you think that this combination that we're talking about, this kind of future where 
LLM based AI and voice interfaces are going to come together. Do you think that might see lead to a resurgence of of robots that are built to be our companions more than just devices that are built to help us in a transactional way? Oh, definitely. I, I think right now we've got the convenience is the main focus. Companionship is just not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's too complicated, it's too expensive, it's too hard to crack. I, I've tested recently a companionship robot that was very cute and adorable and I enjoyed spending time with it, um, but it was totally useless and most of the time really annoying, oh. um, but it was cute. <laughs> Um, but, um, and it was designed specifically to, for aging in place, elder care, ah. um, you know, for, for being a companion for, uh, someone that living alone. And that's a, you know, that's sort of the top of the tier use case for a companion robot. And that's kind of where everyone's sort of working towards at the moment. But ultimately the kind of idea that we will have a sort of an artificially intelligent robot in our home, a kind of Rosie the robot, just to go back back oh, to the, Jetsons, the yeah. early days, the 1980s again, um, or the 60s <laughs> um, from the Jetsons. And, you know, that, that whether it's going to be a single device, though, or whether it's kind of a more um, omniscient oh. presence like computer from Star Trek, yes. um, I think that, I think it's unlikely we're going to have a single robot running around our home and um, being our companion. I think it's more likely to be this disembodied personality like her, <laughs> in our like home basically. that we that knows us and that talks to us more of a more of a she or a her. Her, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, um, um, I mean, I read a really fascinating book. If you, if um, I would highly recommend it, if you're interested in um, artificial please. intelligence and robots, called Clara and the Sun. Um, by uh, Kazu Ishiguro, who wrote Remains of the Day. Yes. He's not an, a sci-fi writer <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, but he's very good at kind of pinpointing a moment in, you know, a sort of key cultural change moment in time kind of in society. And he re his works really examine personal interactions. And this is all about a young girl who has an artificial intelligent robot um, but that looks like a person. And all the children in her in this book all have that's their buddy they have this personal companion that looks like a robot uh, let me sorry that looks like a person but it is an artificially intelligent robot and the whole book is told through the eyes of the robot and oh, it is wow absolutely fascinating um and and really kind of opens your eyes to what you know to the it the fascinating benefits of ai and the ultimate sort of fears that everyone has yeah. about AI and where they could lead us. So I highly recommend reading that. That's um, Clara yes, and the I, Sun, you know, is that correct? One Clara and the Sun, Thank yes. Uh, K-L-A-R-A -A and the Sun. And Thank it you. is, um, it's, a, it's a great sort of, it's a great commentary on where we may end up with AI and robots. <laughs> Maybe, but in uh, terms of the home, yeah, to I be would, completely, uh, completely less um, pessimistic, um, I, my ultimate view is that our homes will become like computers. Hmm. Just like our car has become a computer. Indeed. Um, just like Kit. <laughs> we yes. have Kit in our cars, almost, almost. I think that, that sort of disembodied... Um, uh, omniscient type of um, artificial intelligence that doesn't, you know, that, that runs our homes for us or responds to requests for us, tells us when our air conditioning is broken before we get home from a two-week vacation, not speaking from experience, <laughs> um, <laughs> then, you know, those types of things are going to, that, that benefit, that convenience that a computer that knows what's happening in your home, like a computer that knows what's happening in your car, can bring you in terms of repairs or maintenance or helping things work better. Um, and then we'll have some kind of a personality that you kind of connect with that knows about you, that offers you Netflix recommendations because it knows what you like, what kind of shows you like, you know, that th yeah. that's coming for sure. Um, but I think the little robot that sits on our kitchen counter or that walks around the house, um, maybe, you know, sweeping up after us is probably going to stick, stay with being a Roomba or a, um, a little uh, toy for your kids rather than being the kind of must have in everyone's home. <laughs> right. Unless we get to the point where you can build that, you know, where, where they can access that, that kind of, um, cloud-based personality, that cloud-based companion, right? Where you could, if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to take a little, um, 
one of those uh, what what they're, they're those rollerboard luggage things that we were all seeing for five years ago that oh, they yes. would follow you around, right? Yes. <laughs> it's like if if, if the uh, inject the personality into it. Yeah, right. If the six G yes. connection is fast enough or whatever, that you can just put it into whatever you happen to be carrying. I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. This this makes me want to. That- have a follow-up AI episode because we, in the last episode, we kind of got really deep into how AI works. And I would love to explore some more of the, um, the, the possible permutations of where it goes in the future. And I love that idea. I mean, I'm obviously susceptible to anthropomorphizing technology. Um, so this, you're, you're speaking my language. I would like this. <laughs> Thank you for braving the heat and, uh, the busted AC and, and coming on to talk with us about this. This is, um, a really interesting topic. And I I really do think you have inspired me to put one more episode on the rotation about uh, perhaps the confluence of AI and social robotics in the future. Um, Thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for everything. And uh, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Michael. It was a real pleasure to chat with you. Sometimes on this show, we talk about the tech future we currently have, and sometimes we talk about a future that's yet to come. But on the lucky days, we get to celebrate them both. Despite my frustrations with my current set of assistants, after that chat with Jennifer Tui, I'm eager to see what the next chapter has in store for voice assistants and the people who use them. Once again, you can find her byline at The Verge. Meanwhile, it's time for me to say hello, computer, and hit the mute button on myself until the next episode. If you'd like to hear another installment on AI, this time on its potential future uses in social robotics, well, that's something I'd like to do, but I need your input. So tweet, skeet, or send me your thoughts at Captain Two Phones on Twitter, threads, and Instagram. Until next time, thanks once more to my sponsor, MediaTek, and thanks to you, for listening. I've been Michael Fisher, and I'll see you in the future. I've been Michael Fisher, and I'll see you in the future. <laughs>